Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, mm, I want to say thank you for your bravery. I was, uh, it's always helpful to take a moment and remember why we do this. So thank you. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Vita Hamilton for, for a number of things. First, for the excuse to come to Ireland and spend time in Galway and Clifton and the Aran Island. Uh, and also for your leadership of a very important program. And uh, it, that's what it takes. It takes leadership and it takes the efforts of all of you to change the way we treat sepsis, to do the right thing for our patients. We always say we want to make the uh, right thing to do, the easy thing to do, and we strive for that, but it's not really true. It's really difficult to do quality work, and it's really hard to remember uh, that putting our patients' interests ahead of our own time is the right thing to do. So I thank all of you for that. I also thank all of you for the work you're doing. I looked at all your posters, and your mortality rate is the same in Ireland as it is in the United States. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but it's, it's uh, good compared to other countries, and I congratulate you for your work. And the work you're doing is very exciting. I see your emphasis on education, your emphasis on early identification, your emphasis on keeping track of audit and feedback. And we've all learned that the most potent way to change clinical behavior is by keeping track of what we do and holding each other accountable for what we do. And certainly, um, my experience over the last 15 years, and I have the scars to show it, is that physicians don't like to be held accountable. Uh, in the United States, we call them cowboys. Uh, physicians like to think that they just, because they care about their patients, they do the right thing. And I won't use the word that I would normally use to describe that, but it's just simply not true. And that we all need to be reminded. And prompts and performance measures and keeping track of our performance is really important. So I, I encourage you to keep going. And, and now what I want to talk about is... Uh, our attempt with sepsis 3.0 to completely confuse the field of sepsis. And uh, I, I say that only half jokingly as I'm gonna show you in a moment. And what I wanna talk about for the next 45 minutes is the path of this definition. And in particular, I wanna point out uh, where some of the misunderstanding about the definition is and where I think it's important to remember and keep our eyes focused and our attention focused on our quality improvement efforts and not let new definitions get in the way of our progress in that regard. So that's what I'm gonna do for the next little while. I have no financial disclosures. I have a ton of intellectual bias that I'm gonna spread all over this audience for the next 45 minutes. I have a feeling it's not different from your biases, but that's certainly true. So I'm, there's so much attention, which is fantastic. For years, when we started the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, we couldn't get national funding agencies to pay attention to funding sepsis. We could get them to pay attention to funding bench research, but we really couldn't get them to pay attention to funding any kind of quality improvement in sepsis at all. And then what started to appear are things like this, and I, there are so many like this, but this is an article from JAMA that looks at uh, the causes of 30-day readmissions in the United States. And finally, and I think fortunately, sepsis is the number one cause of readmissions in 30 days of all, of all diagnoses. Sepsis is the most expensive condition that we treat in the United States. It's $20 billion a year, and that's true globally. Sepsis, sepsis is common, it's fatal, and it's expensive. And finally, as we get more and more data that demonstrate that, we're getting more attention from where it's really important, which is funding agencies that help fund efforts like this, and government agencies, which also help fund um, efforts like this. And I was really impressed to hear the minister speak so knowledgeably about the importance of sepsis and the work that you're all doing. So sepsis definitions. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the third international uh, consensus definitions for sepsis. The first two, were published in uh, 1991 and then 2001. I headed the second one. And we start, and as you know, there are a lot of problems with these first two definitions. And in many ways, the biggest complaint uh, 
about the first two definitions is sirs. Now it's ironic that I'm going to end this talk by saying that as much as we'd like to proclaim the death of sirs, we're still using sirs in 2017 to identify patients with septic sepsis, and I'm not sure that's going to change. But nonetheless, that's what motivated another look 10 years after we published the second sepsis 2.0, as it's now called. Part of what motivated that are these two manuscripts. So these two manuscripts, the top one is uh, from um, Mike Howell's group. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is Ronaldo Bellamo's group. And what this showed, and was published in the New England Journal, this, this showed that in a cohort <clears throat> of hospitalized patients who are discharged with sepsis, about 12% of those patients never have any evidence of SIRS whatsoever. So this manuscript actually said SIRS was not adequate, not sensitive enough to use to diagnose infection. <clears throat> the bottom piece, which was Mike Howell's group from the University of Chicago in the United States, showed that uh, w they looked at a large cohort of wards patients in the University of Chicago over a one-year period, and they showed that greater than 40% of all patients on the wards at some point met the SERS criteria. That is two out of four SERS. So their point, which we all know, is that SERS is a very hypersensitive measurement tool for diagnosing infection. And so that led to the third international consensus definition conference, which was started in San Francisco in 2004 and then continued back and forth between Europe and America over the next two years and gave rise to three manuscripts that were published simultaneously in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The first was the one that was the overall definition. The second was assessment for clinical criteria in sepsis. And the third was revisiting the clinical criteria for septic shock. So let's go through this a little. There's a lot of confusion about the new definition but the one thing that I stand by that I think is the most important advance for the new definition, definition is it aligned our language. When we previously, as we know, in 1991 and 2001, we had sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. But when we sign out to our colleagues, either, either at the end of a nursing shift, at the end of a physician shift, and we say, I'm worried about Mrs. Jones. Keep your eye on her. I think she's getting septic. We never say, I think she's getting severely septic. But by the original definitions, we are septic when we have a bronchitis and develop a fever and stay home and our heart rate inevitably goes up because we're not drinking much and we hunker down under the covers and we sweat and we stay home for two days with a bronchitis. We never refer to ourselves as septic. We identify communally, globally, sepsis is bad. Sepsis is not a bronchitis. Sepsis is the story we heard just before, where people go on to develop organ dysfunction and lose digits. So sepsis is the term we use that is really meaning severe sepsis. So the biggest decision and consensus in the definitions conference this time was we might as well call it like it is. We use the term infection when we have a bronchitis. We use the term sepsis when patients develop organ dysfunction. And we use the term shock when people develop unresponsive hypotension to fluid resuscitation. So we agreed not to define infection. That's going to become very important when I go through the clinical criteria. Because as a task force, we decided to start from looking at po populations that were infected. And as I said, we thought sepsis re re really represents badness. And in fact, in the task force for a while, we were going to use the term badness in the JAMA article. And we were literally going to describe sepsis as badness. Infection gone bad, and we thought, we can't do that. E even though that's exactly what we think it is. But we decided badness really wasn't quite medical enough. 
But we did decide severe sepsis is not helpful. So these are the new definitions. And I think these align with our clinical language that we've used for 20 years since the term sepsis was introduced. That is, a simple UTI, a simple walking pneumonia, a simple skin infection is an infection. When a patient develops organ dysfunction, that's sepsis. And as I said, when a patient develops shock unresponsive to fluid resuscitation, that's septic shock. So these are the changes, and I know that your national initiative in Ireland is about to be consistent with these definitions. And I do think these definitions are accurate now. The problem is, as I'm going to talk about towards the end of this, is the problem with coding, and in the United States in particular, one of the quality improvement initiatives. So the definition of sepsis now is not two out of four <clears throat> SERS criteria and a suspected or documented source of infection, which was the previous definition. I'm going to say that again. The previous definition in 1991 and then 2001 was two out of four SERS criteria and a suspected or documented infection. Now we're saying sepsis is exactly what we've always felt, which is that it's something bad. It's a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So that's the definition piece. And if I could stop there, I don't think there would be any confusion. Because I think the sepsis 3.0 definition itself is consistent, as I keep saying, with our clinical jargon. But what we also wanted to do, recognizing that the SERS criteria, leukocytosis or leukopenia, hyperthermia or hypothermia, tachycardia and tachypnea, those four were chosen arbitrarily in the first consensus conference by Roger Bone. And it wasn't even a matter of consensus. Roger Bone, who's probably one of the foremost names in history in sepsis, went back to his hotel room, he chaired the first conference, and he just looked at his notes and he said, I think we should call some of this SIRS. And he invented the term SIRS when the conference was over because it made sense. And it has made sense to us because they are such common signs and symptoms of the body's response to infection for a long time. But we thought what we should do is try to identify a more data-driven way to predict bad outcomes in infection. I'm going to say that again. Because what we were trying to do with these clinical criteria were not to define sepsis but rather to identify a set of criteria that we could use to predict who had an infection and was going to do poorly, which obviously we know is really important. In many ways, that's much more important than defining sepsis. As much as we struggle to define sepsis, most of us know sepsis when we see it. Now, sometimes it's hard because we see someone who has a history of heart disease and they come in with a mildly elevated white count, <clears throat> bilateral infiltrates, and you don't know if their congestive heart failure is worse or this is a new pneumonia. But for the most part, diagnosing sepsis, defining it is not hard. It's predicting who's going to get worse. And that's what we tried to do with the second piece. And so we took a large database from the Univers University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and then it was validated, you see here, with the Kaiser Permanente Northern California. That's a large healthcare system in the United States. That's a single party payer, much like Ireland. Uh, the VA system, which had uh, over a million records. Uh, the alerts database from Germany, courtesy of Conrad Reinhardt. And the Kings County and Seattle EMS. So there are about six million records that went into doing this logistic regression. And in fact, we did exactly that a logistic regression in which the outcomes were badness. So we define badness as death in the hospital or a prolonged stay more than five days in the intensive care unit. So we did a logistic regression using all the 21 variables from the second definitions conference. So if you remember, the difference between the first conference and the second was the first conference really just talked about SERS, four criteria. In the second one, 
we published now the famous Table 1, which was a list of 21 variables that we said two or more of them <clears throat> would represent um, the inflammatory response, and that with a suspected or documented source of infection would be sepsis. We took those 21 variables and put them in a multivariable logistic regression model and said which of these 21 variables predicts death or a prolonged ICU stay. So that's the basis for what's now known as QSOFA. It was simply taking all the 21 variables that we published in 2001, mixing them together, modeling them, and saying which predicts bad outcome. And that's how QSOFA was born. Out of that <clears throat> logistic regression, these three variables appeared. A respiratory rate greater than 22. Now notice, it's greater than 22. I don't know how it is in Ireland, but if we said 20, you know that every patient in every hospital at every moment all across the world has a rep respiratory rate of 20. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So fortunately, it's 22, which means someone's actually counting. <laughs> and confusion, altered mental status. Now, this originally started out as, as a Glasgow coma score less than 12. And through various iterations, we were able to reduce it to altered mental status. And what's interesting about altered mental status is that there's a lot of face validity. So many of uh, the nursing staff on wards and in the intensive care unit will tell you that they, nothing makes them more nervous than when a patient starts to become febrile and confused and slightly altered. And that's borne out by this logistic regression. And then the third one, which is probably the most problematic and has caused the most controversy, is a systolic blood pressure less than 100. Because many of us would like to use a tool for early diagnosis. And most of us will say that by the time someone whose blood pressure starts out at a systolic of 140, has a systolic blood pressure of less than 100, it's not rocket science to say, this person's not going to do well. Nonetheless, of all the variables, including the SERS, remember, the 21 variables, including the four SERS criteria that I just mentioned, of all the variables, it's these three that were, were able to demonstrate the highest predictive ability of who would do worse. Now, I want to keep saying this because this is where the confusion is. These three variables do not define sepsis. These three variables do not define sepsis. And I've heard so many interns and residents say, well, I've got to look for these three variables because if they're not there, the patient doesn't have sepsis. And that's absolutely not what we intended, and it's not what this model said. This model is saying, in infected patients, who is likely to do worse? That's a very different question than who has sepsis. So that's very important as we look at QSOFA. Septic shock. <clears throat> so what we looked for with septic shock was to define a group of patients who had a significantly higher mortality rate than other patients. And so we wound up with this group. Oops, that didn't come out very well, sorry. A group, and this is why the definition now is so clunky. Because when we looked at patients with hypotension after fluids who were on vasopressors, but whose lactate was not abnormal, you see here, I don't have a pointer, I don't think, but you see here in the second row down, the second row down, you see a mortality rate of 30%. But in patients who remain hypotensive, who are on vasopressors, and whose lactate's greater than two, their mortality rate is significantly higher than any of the other hypotensive, hypotensive patients, 42%. So that's the way in which we decided that the definition of septic shock should be hy refractory hypotension on vasopressors with a lactate greater than 2. And of course, the question is of lactate. 
why a lactate greater than two rather than a lactate greater than four. Now remember, <clears throat> a lactate greater than two has always identified organ dysfunction, right? We have always say someone has organ dysfunction if they have a lactic acidosis of greater than whatever the local lab is, often it's two or 2.2 millimoles per liter. The question is a lactate greater than four. Lactate greater than four was introduced by Manny Rivers as part of the early goal-directed therapy, and to a certain extent, that lactate greater than four came out of Manny's data that said patients with a lactate greater than four had a much higher mortality rate than patients with two to three and three to four. But we published this out of the 30,000 patient database of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, and we used this to inform the decision making about what level of lactate to use for septic shock definition. And you can see here, there's a linear increase in the odds ratio of mortality for any elevation in lactate. So lactate is a very good marker for predicting mortality. And it does, we don't have to use four as a cutoff. You can see that the kind of inflection point starts more at two millimoles per liter, which is why we chose two for the definitions of septic shock. So the new clinical criteria for septic shock is that it's a subset of sepsis in which profound circulatory, cellular, and metabolic abnormalities are associated with a greater risk of mortality than with sepsis alone. And you see the definition. Now, the problem with this definition, as we all know, is that if you work in an under-resourced culture without access to lactate measurement, your patients will never have septic shock. Now, obviously, that's not true. Patients in shock, if they don't have an elevated lactate, still have septic shock. But for the purposes, it's, it is what happens when you get a lot of academic docs in a room on and off for two years. We look for the most data-driven definition. And as I just showed you, a lactate greater than two really identifies this subgroup of populations who are at much greater risk for mortality. So if we could stop there, I, I think things would be OK. We have infection, sepsis, septic shock. Septic shock is now a lactate greater than 2 rather than a lactate greater than 4. So, and QSOFA is really meant to predict who does worse, except there has been so much misunderstanding and misinterpretation of these three manuscripts that people like me wind up going all over the world to try to clarify all of the um, confusion that we generated by these three manuscripts, for, for lack of a better descriptor. So I'm going to mention three of them. One of them is not really relevant for this audience in Ireland because it's really more for the US, but I'm going to just show you anyway the struggle. The biggest problem, I think, is how to use QSOFA. And, and I'm going to, I keep emphasizing it because not a day goes by where I don't get an email from someone who is looking for help, working with their interns and residents, their physicians, who are determined to say that if a patient doesn't have a respiratory rate greater than 22, altered mental status, or a systolic blood pressure less than 100, the patient's not septic, and therefore is reluctant to treat. That's the scariest part of QSOFA. If we think that QSOFA was ever meant as a trigger for treatment, then we're going to hurt a lot of patients unnecessarily. QSOFA was just meant for us in the emergency department or on the wards to say, OK, who should we worry about? Can I send this patient home from A&E? Or do I really need to think about putting this patient in the intensive care unit? And we introduced QSOFA as hypothesis generating to a certain extent, that it needed testing and further prospective trials. So SIRS still has its place. Because remember what I showed you, the logistic regression that we used to determine QSOFA started with data, 6 million infected patients. The way they determined how patients were infected in these large databases is they looked for blood cultures and antibiotics within three hours of each other. So patients that had those two within three hours went into this large database as infected. So there was no attempt with the development of QSOFA to talk about screening for infection. 
which is why SERs are still have to be used to look for patients prospectively of who might be infected. Because those four, and there are more than four obviously, but we still need to use the most common signs and symptoms of infection to help us identify early patients who are likely infected. Then we can, can begin to look for organ dysfunction or predict badness. But first, prospectively, we have to identify who should we be worried about. So SIRS is appropriate. It just doesn't mean that there's a dysregulated host. It doesn't mean the patient's septic. SIRS just means the patient may well be infected. We need organ dysfunction to diagnose sepsis. In fact, Jean-Louis Vincent and I and Greg Martin wrote this editorial where we tried to, in the critical care, it's actually been published, where we just tried to show that sepsis can be present without a sofa, Q sofa score greater than two, and that there is a big overlap between Q sofa infection and sepsis. And there are other dysfunctions such as hypoxemia and elevated lactate. Elevated lactate doesn't show up in sofa scores. So we have to be really careful to not confuse a model for predicting who will do worse with a screening tool for infection and sepsis. Now I'm just going to show you, there are a lot of them, but I'm going to go very quickly. Since we published QSOFA in February 2016, there are now about 40 manuscripts in the peer review literature, and it grows day by day. And that's good because, <clears throat> as I said, we introduced QSOFA as hypothesis generating, and people are rapidly beginning to look at comparing QSOFA and other severity scores. And what's, what's being demonstrated, this, this is QSOFA versus SIRS, uh, and this um, uh, is from uh, the United States. And you see here, this is QSOFA versus SIRS, and um, you see that in many instances, there's QSOFA versus SIRS in each of the two panels, and although QSOFA seems better in most, they're not always statistically significant. So in terms of ventilator-free days, organ dysfunction-free days, and renal dysfunction-free days, there's no value in prediction. There's, there's no um, improvement in prediction ability with QSOFA versus simple SIRS. This is another on the prognostic accuracy. This is from JAMA. Again, they're all 2017. This is predicting in hospital mortality. And you can see QSOFA and SOFA compared to SIRS. There is a difference of about 0.1 in the receiver operating curve. So in this study, QSOFA and SOFA appear to be better than SIRS. And I'm showing you them all to give you a sense of how mixed the literature is to date on the value of SIRS versus QSOFA. And I'm going to show you <clears throat> the one with which you're all familiar, use and news, in a minute. Oh, this is it, right here. And you can see in this, and this is also from the University of Chicago, <clears throat> and they compared QSOFA and SIRS and uh, Muse and News, and you can see the area under the curve, that is the balance between sensitivity and specificity was best for News and Muse, and far outperformed SIRS and QSOFA. So things that you know here in Ireland, and they've been doing in the UK for a while, that we're just learning about now in the United States and other countries, that in fact, SIRS, there may be a better way to identify patients with infection prospectively, better than QSOFA. Um, <clears throat> this is from Singapore, also a small study. It's a retrospective review. And you see here in this study the difference between QSOFA and SIRS, and those are the two middle lines, the two middle lines of QSOFA and SIRS. There is no difference between, between QSOFA and SIRS in predicting mortality and length of stay in the intensive care unit for patients who were admitted from the emergency department. So another manuscript, although small, that identifies no difference between these two scores. This is, um, I believe this is from Australia. This is Lancet ID. Uh, no, this is from Boston, I apologize. 
Um, this is a large stroke database that was looked at retrospectively. They identified 2,500 patients um, with infection. And you look, you're seeing on the left in hospital mortality versus one year mortality. And you see that QSOFA and SOFA outperform SIRS. So the conclusion by these authors were that SIRS and QSOFA were better for predicting ICU mortality and hospital mortality than SIRS. Um, this, is, this is a yet unpublished but in press manuscript that used the MIMIC3 database, which is a Harvard database that has um, over a million patients in it. And they looked at the ability of SIRS, the, um, the CEP1 and 2 definition versus CEP3 definition QSOFA. And this is important because it identified that using the QSOFA CEP3 definition under identifies patients who were identified through sepsis 1 and sepsis 2, raising the question that if we use QSOFA, we miss a lot of patients in the emergency department. And I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. I just um, I wanted you to get a sense of the published literature and how mixed the results are with QSOFA so you can keep QSOFA in context when you hear people, especially at large international conferences, especially the authors, not all the authors, by the way, of these three manuscripts sound like I do. I'm just full disclosure. There is much more defensiveness amongst some of my colleagues who just feel that QSOFA is the best thing since sliced bread. And it's the only data-driven set of clinical criteria. And yet the data in the literature now are suggesting Wait a minute, we're not so sure. So how do we use QSOFA? Absolutely, we need more prospective validation. The, in the one year, I said already there are over 40 manuscripts, and the jury's out. It's mixed. I think the current recommendation, recommendation is if you do monitor QSOFA, it should make us concerned that there's infection, and we should look for infection and organ dysfunction. If it's confirmed prospectively, it might be helpful, but we have a long way to go. The most important thing is to treat the patient in front of you. Nowhere do any of my colleagues say that we should use QSOFA to trigger treatment. QSOFA just is risk prediction. You treat infection, oliguria, hypoxemia, elevated lactate as indicated, and you start the sepsis bundles the one-hour sepsis bundle, the three-hour sepsis bundle, and now more and more, as you are going to be introduced to today, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign is doing away, to a certain extent, with the three- and six-hour bundles and saying, why are we waiting to treat sepsis? When you identify sepsis, we should treat people as quickly as possible. Blood cultures, oxygen, lactate, antibiotics, and resuscitate with fluids. You don't wait until QSOFA criteria are met. So I'm just going to briefly go over coding. Coding is a problem in the United States. I don't know in Ireland whether ICD-10 coding is important. It is, yeah. So in the US, this is where we really screwed up, right? Because in the US, the ICD-10 codes determine how much hospitals are reimbursed and how much providers are reimbursed. And if you look, what we did <clears throat> in the JAMA article, we suggest two ICD-10 codes. So the ICD-10 code for sepsis is the severe sepsis ICD-10 code. And the ICD, the, the, it's easy for shock, right? It's R6521, I can't even believe I know the code. But <laughs> R6520 is the one we listed in the manuscript as representing sepsis. But that's easy for us to say. Third-party payers like the government and insurance companies in the US, our clinicians are writing sepsis and billing for severe sepsis. So we're getting all these returns from insurance companies saying, no, 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 and downcoding us to the sepsis diagnosis, which is a much lower acuity ICD-10 code. And the same thing's happening for hospitals. So we were, I thought you could write sepsis and bill for severe sepsis. But the government and third-party payers are much too smart for that. They say, you're writing sepsis. We're going to pay you for sepsis. And sepsis doesn't have organ dysfunction. 
And we're now working with state by state providers who are having a denied claims and working with appeals and writing programs for appeals so that we don't be, we're not penalized for changing the definition to align with the language we've used. But an ICD-10 may change, but you know it's not going to change very quickly. So we're really stuck with coding sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. Oh, there's the code that I mentioned. So these two codes that we're recommending are severe sepsis and septic shock, and they really can't use them if you're writing sepsis as a diagnosis. So the other problem in the United States is CMS. CMS is our national health care. And they started, fortunately from my point of view, a national initiative of mandated public reporting with our performance measures that we developed in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. And they're called SEP1. <clears throat> and it's a nationwide initiative that every hospital in the United States has to report compliance. The problem is, is the initiative started with the definitions of sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. And then we came along, some of the people who actually helped build the performance measures and changed it all. And fortunately, CMS, the government in the US, said, no thanks. We're going to stick with the old definitions. So a lot of, often when I'm talking to a US audience, at the end of all of the words that I just said about how good I think these new definitions are, I have to say just ignore it. <laughs> because you're, we are held accountable for the performance of our patients who are septic, severely septic, and who have septic shock. And if you mix sepsis with severe sepsis, your outcomes are not gonna look very good. And so, we're backtracking and saying to folks in the US, the, the, actually CMS, the government, came and wrote a letter to JAMA announcing they would not accept the SEP3 definitions. Right. So, so we changed the definitions just after ICD-10 was released in the midst of the SEP1 initiative in the United States, just when we had proven that compliance with sepsis bundles improves survival. You got to, you really do have to ask, what were we thinking? <laughs> and I think that's a good question. And I think it was a good idea, but it's caused a lot more confusion than I think we had anticipated. I still stand by uh, the fact that they do reflect our clinical use of the term sepsis. And once we sort out <clears throat> the ICD-10 coding, I think we'll all feel better about the terminology of infection, sepsis, and septic shock. But for now, it really is a problem, the two coding. And as far as septic shock goes, I think that the incidence of patients who have refractory hypotension, who are on vasopressors, who lactate is not greater than two is very small. And we have data, there are tons of data. Almost always, the, these folks have elevated lactate. And the bottom line is, of course, we're going to call those patients septic shock. This is an academic definition. And we certainly wouldn't treat a patient for septic shock just because their lactate was normal if they're hypotensive and on vasopressors. So here's the debate in summary. I think the advantages of sepsis-3 Consistency of language. It's the first data-driven data. SOFA is a good score for measuring organ dysfunction. The SERS criteria maybe finally are dropped, at least for the purposes of QSOFA. And QSOFA does use easily assessed variables, respiratory rate, mental status, blood pressure. Notice the list of disadvantages and the size of this list. I mean, I'm just being honest. SOFA is not routinely measured in many intensive care units. And SOFA validated against SERS uh, uh, is not with organ dysfunction. So in the original paper, we didn't really validate, so compare SOFA to SERS. We, we compared SOFA to SERS, not SOFA to that definition of sepsis. Lactate was not a part of SOFA uh, or QSOFA. And I, I didn't show you the slides why in the interest of time. News is already established as a valuable measure. <clears throat> there is confusion about QSOFA, I mentioned over and over again. SERS is still needed for screening, and I already mentioned this, the coding issues and the fact that the criteria for septic shock are um, 
leave out cultures that are under-resourced that can't measure lactate. So you could see the balance here is sort of definitely tipping one way. So I think only time will tell if this is, this is a slide that I, I use for the US, but this is what I say. Don't change your documentation. And I left this in for this audience because I think it's important that someone who's part of the authorship of all three is telling you what I'm saying in public in the United States. You can't change, you can't adopt these new definitions because we won't be reimbursed properly. And more importantly, we lose the common language that the government is using right now. And I know I've seen some of the work that you're doing in Ireland that you're going to talk about later today. And I think it's consistent with that. So in summary, I'll leave you with, I do think, I've said this a million times, uh, I, that's my little bit of defensiveness coming out. I think they are consistent with clinical use. I keep saying QSOFA was not intended as a screening tool for infection. SIRS is overly sensitive, but it will identify more patients with severe sepsis than QSOFA. And I think for now, that's probably more important than under-identifying. The ICD-10 codes are clearly not consistent with sepsis 3 Point zero, and if that matters in a country, then you have to be very cognizant of that when you code and when you document. Lactate, without question, remains valuable for risk assessment, which is why we incorporated it into the definition for septic shock. And finally, until further perspective validation, I don't think QSOFA should be in routine use. I think it's fine to measure QSOFA, to keep track in your institution, because it's valuable. And if it turns out that QSOFA is a very good way of predicting bad outcomes, it's an easy thing to measure. It's just not there yet. And the recent, as I showed you, the recent published trials have mixed results. So the final message is I think the new definitions are OK. I think the coding is a problem. And I think QSOFA is not ready for prime time. And with that, I'll say thank you. So we have some time for questions or arguments. I'm from New York, so I like arguing. Although, I'm in Ireland. What am I talking about? <laughs> Anybody? Yep. Oh, I have to say that in public. Um, I, think, I think using QSOFA too quickly is, runs the risk of causing harm. And some of the data that I showed you supports that. It's too soon. Yes. Thank you. Um, that was a great talk. Um, do you think I'm an infectious disease practitioner? So one of the things we struggle with is antibiotic stewardship. And like the US, we are now, we have evolving CREs. Do you think QSOFA may be a, a way to identify higher risk patients and maybe allow for more liberal antibiotic use in those patients? Um, that's interesting. What you're, I, normally, infectious disease practitioners ask me, don't, they think, don't I think that our performance measures that encourage antibiotics within one hour are likely to lead to too rampant and too early use of antibiotics. Notice that I'm primed, I'm, I'm, because I've been asked it so much. We're, we're working with the Centers for Disease Control in the United States to partner the aggressive use of antibiotics with antibiotics, antibiotic stewardship. I, in answer to your question, I, I think anyone who I suspect is infected should get antibiotics immediately. I don't care whether they're going to get worse or not. And so to me, and, and I, this causes debate, but I think give a dose of antibiotics. And then in the morning, as ICU clinicians or clinicians on the wards reassess, do I really need to use it? But I feel if my relatives comes into the emergency department and there's any question in that physician's mind whether I'm infected, I want them to get an antibiotic. I don't want them to wait. And if it turns out they got an unnecessary antibiotic, it's not the worst thing that's going to happen to them in a hospital. 
I really and think so. I suppose just to say, I'm, I'm not saying that they wouldn't get an antibiotic. I'm saying that you might use a broader spectrum ah, reserved broader spectrum. antibiotic, so particularly relating to carbapenem. So one of the issues that we have is, is trying to restrict carbapenem use. But as I say, if you have you know, a sick patient or your mother is very sick, you know, as you're at the foot of the bed, you want to use a carbapenem. So could it be a, a strategy for rationalizing carbapenem use empirically up front, realizing that the goal is to step down? That's a great question. I, I honestly can't answer that. I, I do think, though, <coughs> carbapenem wouldn't be based on the severity of illness. It would be based on your local uh, antibiotogram. So, but it, that's a great thing to test prospectively. Um, I just might um, add my point of view from the Irish program. So what we recommend is that the infection diagnosed on history and examination uh, based on the site and source of the infection um, is treated according to the locally available uh, antimicrobial guideline. Same. Great. Well, hi, I just uh, want to ask a question. My, I'm a coding manager. Um, Where are you? Here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hiding. Um, I just want to know, um, if your sepsis is hospital acquired, um, under the reimbursement scheme, are you paid out? Um, are your hospitals paid out, or you know, kind of, do the private insurers pay out? Say that again. If your sepsis is hospital acquired, uh -huh. ah. you know, and coded under the reimbursement scheme, are your hospitals paid out? Yeah. So it depends on the hospital acquired infection. So ventilator associated pneumonias and central line associated bloodstream infections are not paid. But if you're in the hospital and you develop C. diff, for now at least, yes. Um, and nosocomial pneumonias that you develop, hospital-acquired pneumonias that you're in the hot, not necessarily on a ventilator. So some hospital-acquired infection, acquired infections are paid for, but that list is shrinking rapidly. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you.